All right, Skip, uh, welcome to the Mill House in my house. Uh, Thank you very much. You know, it's um, your book came out in uh, 2015. I had read this um, Ron Hamlin's book a long time ago, Tournament. And I saw, I read this book and I thought, I know this book is based on real life stories and real people. And then I read your book and it confirmed that, yes, Hamlin's book was written about real people, real parties, and real fish. Your book has got to be really a, a great success story about your career. Uh, it was one of those things where people say, Skip, you should write a book after hearing your stories. And then when you sit down there and put it together and you start from your humble beginnings on a drift boat, and then to where we ended up catching Blue Marlin on four pound line. It was an incredible journey, great accomplishments, and just there is stories to be told in there. Right, well, again, it's uh, Tales of a Hooker and a Madam. You can find it on Amazon. This is the second read, if that's how captivating it is. I got this book and I literally did not leave my house for about four days, I was just riveted. Um, we'll get into those tales a little bit, but tell me about the early years of Skip Smith and your fishing and how you really got embedded with the sport. Well, my grandfather had a head boat, and he used to fish out of Montauk, and then he used to bring it down here in the winter in the 40s and fish out of Fort Lauderdale on Andrews Avenue. So he was quite the fisherman over the years. I had a great-grandfather that was a boat captain uh, up on the Great Lakes, so it was kind of in our blood. And then as a kid growing up, my dad was the captain on my grandfather's boat. So every weekend... Every time I could get to the boat, starting from five years old, I was there. And my grandfather was one tough SOB. He, he was on the boat. I was not allowed to fish. Really? I got the bait hooks. So really? It's six, you would seven think that old. a grandfather would want his grandson to have, feel the tug at the end of the string. Not this grandfather. He was a tough old Irishman, and he just made me work, which was a blessing because you, you look back and you learn so much more by watching half the time anyhow right instead of just by just failure alone and, and tying your own hooks and and, and rigging the, your own and base. dealing with the public yeah there was so much to learn in that drift boat he used to make me lasso pilings and tie lines on cleats and he did teach me all that stuff in a harsh way but just being efficient every day my passion was built up to where my dad ran the night trip on fr uh, friday night so he'd come home from the morning trip, take a nap and go out. And I'd come home from school. He goes, all right, you want to go with me? I take a nap. I would lay in that bed and I could not sleep. My visions were huge. I'm going to go on the night trip. And the night trips were cool because not only did you catch a lot of kingfish and, and uh, uh, not too much else. It was mostly kingfish at night. But on the lee side of the boat, I would net all sorts of bait. I netted little baby sailfish, octopus, everything wow. that came up in the light on the reef back then. We had probably had prettier water back in the 60s but so I was so excited but the problem was by not taking a nap was too excited after the first drift I'd lay down for a second and next thing you know my dad was waking me up at the dock <laughs> it was over <laughs> would you think too that maybe your grandfather and being so strict put those you know the DNA into your being uh to pursue the captain aspect of it well I mean fishing yes but too uh, that's a lot about guiding, tying hooks and, 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 and rigging stuff and doing the, I would I, say, the ground level work. As I wrote in my book, though, my goal wasn't to be the best fisherman. My goal was to keep the boat running so I could fish every day. So being on that drift boat, when you, had to, uh, you were down, you were painting, you were in the engine room helping, handing tools to the mechanic or your father or your grandfather as they you know, changed the impeller. So you learn how to keep that boat alive and, and so she's ready to go. And those little things that I think we learned back in those days made me a better captain because we didn't have the internet. And we maybe didn't. possibly saved your life at one point because you were talking in your book about being adrift at sea with down motors and there was a reef nearby. I think it was over near the Bahamas, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was on the sound machine when we took delivery of the boat, yep. No, the hooker rather, it was a hooker in 1985 going down there. We lost all the oil out of both engines and we were adrift. And, trying to figure out how to get the boat running at least on one motor or be prepared to throw an anchor as we were going to hit the rocks in no time at all. Wind was blowing about 20 knots. It was nasty. My crew got drunk on me. Didn't know it. Drinking rum on their watch, having a ball. They were on vacation. It happens. But the little things you learn the hard way or the, the real basics back then growing up. But the, it, did it prepare myself for being a captain? Yes. 
I had no visions, even in high school, you take those aptitude tests, you know, what I want to be. I had no idea. Right. But in the big picture, you know, all that grooming and growing up on a boat groomed me for being a captain later in right. life. Yeah, I see this. Um, tell me about the long lining, because I know prior, you know, going offshore, running big boats, you were a long liner. What was that like? It was fabulous. It was so great catching the fish we caught. Um, after Jesse and Jerry Webb caught the first swordfish, really out of here, the, the Cubans supposedly caught them for years before that, but they put rod and reeling on the on the map. And next thing you know, there was some boats, sport fishing boats, putting out like five miles of long line. And we heard about it. So me and Craig Koch, my best friend, well, the great fisherman he was, we went and rode along with a long line boat that was fishing just strictly long line. They had converted it. It was one of the first ones called Royal Flush. We went out with them. We saw what they did. We went to um, Marathon and got an island hopper, brought it up and made a long line boat. And we started out with five miles, went to 10 miles. But that was probably 1978. And in its infancy of sword fishing out here, there was so many swordfish that what I called residential swordfish. They were up in 800 feet of water to 1,200. They had scars on them. And it's, they'd, they'd stay there. Yeah. Resident yeah. fish. Yep, they were but, more But it's a pelagic fish. fish. You would think they would be traveling. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Or did billfish actually they, they stage tra- up? They travel, but so many of these fish, there was plenty of bait for them that I think they stayed out there. I mean, there's been tags put in a fish that was like right off Port Everglades, and two years later, it, at 35 pounds, it was released. Two years later, it was caught almost in the same numbers at 100 pounds, gaining about 30 pounds a year. So these fish you know, move up and down the coast. Is it coincidental on the same spot? There's a couple of them that are documented that were caught nearer. Right. So we'd drift our long lines down there, and over two years, we pretty well wiped out the residential fish. After that, we started catching fish that were real streamlined, had deep grooves. They were the travelers. Mm-hmm. They were the ones that were going up and down the coast. What are the deep grooves? In their skin, you can see like deep grooves. Like for some reason, their their skin looked different as they traveled in the depths and whatever they did. And we didn't catch that many small ones. After that, we caught more of the, the fish coming up and down in deeper water. So it changed over two years. There were so many longline boats in 79 and 80. Really? Everybody turned their boat into a longline boat. Because there was so much money in the commercial aspect. It was decent it. money, yep. Yeah. Yep. Between the sm- the drug smugglers that were your other friends that were bringing <laughs> boats back and forth, and the other guys wanted to just fish legally and, and longline out front. So there had to be 25, 30 boats by the time I got out of it. So no wonder the fishing is so bad now. <laughs> well, it wiped out. I hate to things. say that, but obviously, a lot of longliners over the years have depleted a lot of the fisheries, especially the, the coastal stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's the there's the migrations that are way offshore that they catch plenty of them. When I went down to South Africa and fish swordfish, we were fishing offshore where the the locals told us to fish, and we weren't getting any bites. And I asked about inshore and in, you know eight nine hundred feet. I saw a trawler in there, and the captain says, oh, yeah, every once in a while they get swordfish in their nets. I said, pull them in. We ran in there, and we got bite after bite after bite, and they were kind of the residential fish. Interesting. Not too long later, the longliner started up out of Cape Town there and wiped out all those fish, and then they had to fish, you know, two, three, four hundred miles offshore where the sea mounts were and this, that, and the other. But that got wiped out in a hurry, too. But everybody ran in there during the tournament, and everybody got bites all night long. It was a crazy bite but they had the type of scars I'm talking about. Right. Um, what was it like hanging on to a long line and you got, you know, you got a big one. What was that like, you know, well, wiring big fish off of the long line? It, it taught you how to have really, you know, put the pressure on when you need it and let it slide through your hand. So you learn to be a really good wire man and then let go, you know, let it go back to the long line. If it was a big enough fish, you had to let go, but it taught you a great feeling for wiring fish because you're wiring 120 foot a liter. So it really gave you a good touch, you know, especially someone like myself. There was other people I had on the boat that would just hang on too long and pull hooks and not have that feel to let it slide and keep in consistent pressure where they'd have a lot of pressure and then none. Sometimes it'd get, you know, almost wrapped up in it because it'd kind of pop behind you. So, you know, there was a lot more to it than just saying, I wired this fish, you know, and right. hanging on. Because you don't want to pull them off. Every one was three, four, or five hundred dollars. What, uh, so in a five mile string, how many fish would you have to wire on a set? Well, that started out five miles. We ended up at 20 miles. 
So you were setting three to 500 hooks and a good catch could have been 20, 30 fish. And what kind of typical fish were you catching on that long line? Back then we'd catch a lot of Cuban night sharks, but you'd catch maybe 20 swordfish. So you'd have, wow. you'd have sharks, hammerheads, Cuban night sharks. You'd have mola molas occasionally. You'd have manta rays occasionally on the line. You'd have mahi on the line, occasional tunas on the line. So you could catch 50, 60 different, I mean, fish, many different species. And then some nights you'd just catch six swordfish and three sharks, just depending on uh, if you, you know, got in a migration or if someone another had a long line too close to you in front of you in the current, there's, there was a lot of factors that would vary your catch. You talked about um, your dad being a fisherman too. Yep. So did he teach you and, and, and pull you towards this sport as much as your grandfather? Where were the, where was the, uh, the real light bulb? When did that go off and how much of that had to do with your father? The relationship was really with my father because he would take me down to the boat and, you know, I'd be fishing with him on his trips. But most of the time, like I said, when I was young, I didn't get to fish. Right. And every once in a while, maybe in the last drift, they'd let me fish and catch a kingfish and man, I was happy. I really liked muttons were my favorite as a kid, but my dad was probably my biggest influences. Like I got to fish with him all the time and work with him and, you know, growing up. And then when I got to be 15, 16 and dealing with the public and being able to take on more responsibility. I mean, my dad let me dock the boat when I was like eight years old, wow, 65 cool. foot boat Wow. with different, with two right-handed wheels and the, it wasn't left-handed back then. It was a little, he said, I did great the first time. Just put it right in the slip, back, back to right in like there's nothing to it. What was it like for you to go from a long liner to being a captain? Did it, did it feel like you'd made it at that point? Like I'm I was here? A, No, I was already a captain before I went long line. And we were charter fishing out of Bahia Mar. And then all of a sudden the long line came along and the money was 10 times more right. than we were making on the dock. So we kind of juggled both. I could freelance on the dock or you know, you know, work on the dock. And then the good nights I'd go long line and miss a day or two. And the money was so good after a while, it's like the heck with the charter boat. And then when I got injured is when I made the transition over to the hooker. Yeah, tell me about the injury that you had as a longliner. We came up with an idea. Back then, there was no hydraulics or anything. It was um, our, ma our main uh, spool was running off of uh, DC power with a, with a belt going to a motor to drive that. But on the leader cart, it was hand crank. And you'd have uh, about 24 inches of places to put the mono and then you had a little separator where all the hooks went, which was probably about eight to 10 inches wide. So you'd grab a hold of the handle and spin it. You'd attach your, your snap swivel to a hook, put it over in the hook side, and then you'd give the thing a really hard crank. And we came up with a little piece of uh, aluminum coming out of the rod holder that would kind of catch the hook, you know, to, to protect you. So you give it a good spin, and with 120 foot a liter, you'd have to give it maybe two to three spins to collect all the mono to get the next hook out if there's nothing on it. And usually you're reeling in a, big, a squid or a mackerel that you had on for bait. And the one time I got injured, I'm sitting there and I gave it a good spin, and it was a short liter. Someone had not, on the trip before, we had different crews back and forth. They didn't get rid of that liter. So when I spun it, that hook came up so fast, and it jumped through the catch. And I was guiding the line back and forth with my hand. So when that hook came uh. through, it went right into my hand, and I just happened to be uh, angled right towards where all the hooks were in that eight inch gap. So my arm went right into that area. Uh. And then I went up and over and flopped over because of the weight of the, the cart. So now I had hooks in my upper arm all the way down, a couple of buried into my forearm. Oh my gosh. And the one that went in right here, and then up into my ring finger. And so you got gloves on. Oh. So the other crew weren't real, they, they didn't want to be doctors, I can guarantee you that. They just kind of turned their head. So as you're taking the hooks out of yourself, the one that went through my glove was really nasty. So we're, I'm trying to cut the glove off. Meanwhile, you just can't run in. You got 20 miles of line out there you got to get. Yep. You're, just, you're stranded out there. and it's What like, was that pain like? <laughs> it was real severe. I, I didn't cut the hook off the leader and just continue to go because I was kind of done. So I sat there and just worked on it until I got the hook out, but it kept catching a tendon on the barb. So I was uh. trying to go back and forth, back and forth, and I finally got it out of there. But the, the most pain is where I, when I poured the Clorox on there, I just dropped on my knees and uh. tears fell from my eyes as fast as the Clorox dripped from my hand. 
Did uh, did you change positions after that, or did you keep? Oh going? yeah, I was done. I, went, I, I had to run the boat, and I um, was done. Okay. Yeah, I, I went on the leader card any longer. Front, I want to get to the front part of the boat. I right? didn't get to wire any more fish that day. Actually, I didn't get. I couldn't do anything because it took these two fingers out of play for about a couple months. I was just kind of grounded as it healed because it was really made my hand so stiff I couldn't do much uh, with it. You know, the worst is when you when you love to do what you do and you're injured and you can't continue. Yeah. As a skier, I got hurt like before the Olympics in 76. I had, I think I had two knee operations that summer. And when you come back, you know, sometimes you're feeling pretty good and you're good enough um, to participate, but you're not good enough to survive a hit. So I kept getting hurt because I, I needed a year off. So I'd get break a leg and I'd come back and I'd, I'd fall before I was ready to be, before I was really fully healed and I'd get hurt again. So, but like in fishing, I get that. You have a... A hand that's out of commission, but you want to go fishing, but you can't. Oh yeah, your back, your shoulder, no matter what, your knees, your feet, no matter what you are, or just a just a bug when you're when you got the fluid, you still want to go. Well, it's, well you're in a really big game, uh, dangerous big game uh, environment with offshore fishing. What was it like wiring a big monster fish? I think my youth took over because now I'm a little gun shy because I've had marlin jump in the boat before and hurt people. So now more than never, but when I was young, you just grab the leader, you tuck your knees down, and you, you you're in it. You got to get in that position like you did skiing. You got to get squat down. You just didn't want to get top heavy. As a captain, I think I've had about six wiremen pull over on the leader, a couple anglers pull over just from balance and rocking and rolling. Does the wire get hung up in their hand that, so that when they release it, it doesn't get released and they get yanked over? Or how does that work? If they're taking proper wraps, it's easy to get out of it. It's just when you relax, like uh, one of my mates, he grabbed a leader on a hammerhead and he just didn't get in position because he went, ah, oh, darn, it's only a shark. And so when he grabbed a leader, that, heart, the, that he was standing up, he didn't squat down, and that shark just flipped his head like a hammerhead, as you well know. He was over the side in a second. He and had next, no leverage. And next thing you know, I see him going through the water. So I tell the angler to back the drag off because I want to get the body back. <laughs> so he's going through the water, and I'm like, oh, my, he must be tangled. I'm starting to get nervous. And all of a sudden, he's free, and he is swimming back to the boat as fast as he can. Flip-flops are out there. And so I asked him, I said, what, what, what happened? He goes, oh, man. He goes, I was so embarrassed, I got pulled over the side. And then he goes, and, was, and as it's pulling me, I, I thought that was pretty good. It felt pretty cool. And he goes, then I remembered it was a shark. <laughs> <laughs> So he could let go, but the, the things that go through a guy's head, right? And, I, and uh, I had another one of my mates that got pulled over, and he got pulled over on another boat years later, but the leader did cut into his hand, and it squashed down and started pulling the skin up off his fingers. And he, and he kept trying to pull himself up to cut the leader, but the pain was so bad he couldn't. He couldn't pull it. And the marlin stopped to shake his head, and he got it unwrapped, got back to the boat, and they caught the fish and won a bunch of money. But then he had to go get the nerves reattached and everything else. So there is times where they do take a bad rap or something happens where it doesn't come off right. I saw so. a real eye-opener for me. Um, look, I didn't see a saltwater fish until 35 years ago. So this is all new. But I've always been captivated by reading The Old Man in the Sea, some of the Hemingway books, uh, Ron Hamlin. I caught my first uh, sailfish with Ron on a fly a long, long time ago. So I've always been kind of like, you know, interested in this this whole world uh of offshore billfish stuff um but it's uh interesting in that the cockpit chaos did you ever see that video um with stuart campbell that absolutely opened my eyes and it was like shocking so here we are he's what 30 pound test he's got like an 800 pound marlin on over least, in madeira yeah th that situation yep wireman wires the fish a bunch of slack goes around his rod wireman releases and now the rod is attached with no 30 pound it's all 400 and and he gets ripped out of that boat and it's like oh my god people can die doing this oh yeah there's there's been some people that have died wiring fish how how difficult was it um and what was that learning curve like as an offshore captain going to different locations in the world oh, do, do fellow captains share information or was it all on you Back in the 80s, there was nothing. There was, there was, the magazines were barely giving out information. There was no much travel. But like you, I was reading Zane Gray and Hemingway and the places they fished. I mean, they fished Panama and stuff like that. And it got my interest so much that 
the Bahamas was okay, but I kept reading about this Panama and these different places. And I was like, and Dunaway had the same passion I did. He just wanted to go fishing. And I, so I talked him into going. And I was 26 years old. He let me take a 53-foot Hatteras down to Panama. I go, Dunaway, what were you thinking? I was only 26. <laughs> but I did find a guy that had made a Panama Canal. His name was Peter Gunn, Pedro Mistola, Pedro Pistola, asking around if anybody's done that. So I got to meet with him and get some information, and I hired him to take me down there. And uh, we left Key West and went to made our way down to Panama and through the canal, and then he flew home, and I was on my own after that. But there was a little bit of information back then, but it wasn't like it was out there. You remember, you had to go to your home phone to make a phone call. Right, there was no right. instant things to get someone's number, to find somebody. And I think I found him through uh, one of the Marine stores, asking around, hey, does anybody know anybody? He went, oh, yeah, this guy Peter, he's bought some charts in here before. So the Coconut Telegraph was real small back then. So there wasn't much information. And even when I started light tackle fishing, you know, there was no information out there. And Tred Barta had started writing for sport fishing, and he was like the light tackle expert. And, uh, you know, he was writing a little bit of stuff, but didn't apply to, he was doing tunas when we were doing billfish. Right. So it was all real self-taught back then. Everything we learned, and then I shared information with Stuart Campbell, who got pulled over the side. I mean, he was right behind us. He actually broke all our records. But, uh sharing that information was with, with real people like himself was fine right you could share it right but that information really wasn't out there so the traveling the places we went to with the, the hooker alone more or less the madam now there's a marine everywhere back then finding those places was crazy right you know and what, one of the things we did use to find those places th that we wanted to go to we, we found a spot that we had read about you know whether it was ecuador or peru we went to the igfa and made a phone call and found out who the IGFA rep was in that country. And that was what helped us traveling everywhere because the reps were usually very wealthy or well-renowned people in their country. They knew that local area. They gave us all the information. When we got there, they would have customs, immigration waiting for us, whatever it was, they'd be standing there with them. We'd have them all on board for drinks. And so it was that was our biggest secret in traveling was those IGFA reps. They were such, they opened the doors for us everywhere. How nervous were you as a young man traveling these open seas to a foreign location? The nerves were there, but for some reason, it was like the excitement overtook where we overtook your nervousness. Right. You know, because you you were just so excited to be there, and you're young and adventurous, and now I'm probably more nervous than I was then. You, you know, did, because now you know what you didn't know back then. Well, yeah, I mean, you were nervous because you didn't speak the language, but I always tried to have an interpreter with me, which right. made it easier so they couldn't just BS you or try taking advantage of you. So uh, for some reason, I made all the right moves and the way I hired people. And then back in, the, in about 75, 76 maybe, we did, I did a show for the uh, program In Search Of. It was about hijacking yachts. Dr. Spock or whatever his name did the narrating on that one back then. And we did a we did a show where supposedly me myself and the other captain get shot. You can hear the shots. We're out of the picture, and you see the hijacker take our boat away. And that taught me about security on the boats. So even going to these foreign countries, I had security in mind. Don't who to talk to. Keep a watch out. You know. So we had our head on a swivel all the time going to those places. That was probably the most nervous uh, aspect of traveling internationally into the third world countries. Yeah, pirates. Well, well, the, the, there was a fallacy out there of all the pirates in the Bahamas killing people. You had to have guns on board to protect yourself. And I think it was kind of a fallacy or someone just ran into a wrong area where they were smuggling and probably just got a couple of warning shots. Right. A lot of people disappeared, but they were probably involved. Who knows the real story behind all those people. The Miramata smugglers weren't too bad because I knew most of them. <laughs> As the cocaine guys came in, they were just, uh, people started dying everywhere. But still, in traveling like that, you know, I did have guns on board. Uh, stopping in San Andreas, Colombia, which was a well-renowned spot, was dangerous. And it's the same thing now. You just don't go anchor yourself in some cove because it's real pretty because there's going to be a village in there of poor people. So you always got to watch where you go and make sure you go into the bigger places. And, you know, this still happens down there in some of these countries, whether it's uh Guatemala on the east side, you know, there's some renowned places there. There's some bad places in Panama. But like you said, people, oh, the beautiful cove, let's go in our little village. Trouble. They're not always friendly. They're very poor. So you want to stay in the bigger places. And 
we got to Costa Rica. I hired locals for a watchman on the boat. Just uh, It did two things. Number one, it made us friendly with the town by hiring people and paying them. <laughs> Didn't make you that ugly American out there on the big yacht. So by doing that and hiring a watchman and protecting your assets and having a local on the boat was so important. So about everywhere we kind of did that or we, w- we went to places like Tropic Star. When we were in Coiba at uh, Club, Not- Club Pacifico, we had that shootout there where the prisoners took over. That was a crazy yeah. story. Yeah, tell us about that. We were um, at Club Pacifico. He had about eight 26-foot Makos that people would go f- mostly inshore type fishing around the island of Coiba, which was a prison island back there, uh, back then, with, um, or, or um, what was his name, uh, the bad president down there, not Ortega. Um so it was all really bad prisoners were on the island. But a couple of the trustees would earn their way. They got to work in the club as waiters or cooks or whatever. So they could, you know, make a little bit of money. So they were just the guys that weren't out there for murdering too many people. And um, I was, I just, usually I would leave at 4 or 5 in the morning to get a head start to save my fuel. I had to go real slow out there. And I got a call from one of the boats saying, hey, the prisoners are taking over the camp. So I got on the radio and I started calling the prison to get the guards because my radio would go farther. Meanwhile, uh, three prisoners had escaped the prison and I guess they had got a gun from one of the guards they took over and they had to make their way through this heavy, dense jungle down to where the club is. So they knew the club was down there with boats. And they tried to start the boats, but half those boats would never start in the morning. They had to move batteries around. and So they went in there and they... Uh, they took a, a couple people hostage. They took a, guy, a short guy from Colorado and another lady. And they went down the dock and they started shooting into camp at the, ki- at the uh, kitchen in the restaurant, trying to get the guard that was there. The year before we had this guard, I was there, that was, 80, that was 1983. In 82, we had a guard that probably couldn't have shot 10 feet. But the next year in 83, we had a guard that wasn't friendly, younger guy. And when they when they sh- when they shot in there, he snuck around the backside and got behind the b- bar. And the guy was on the end of the dock requesting a boat with a uh, lady with a I think he had a knife. And this guard shot him and took him out right in the head. And she fell down on the dock and he flopped down. And so there was another guy short with a with that short guy from Denver. And, and that guy from Denver decided to try to take that guy out. And he fell off the dock onto the beach. And the guy went to shoot him with that gun and it jammed or something. So the guard shot that prisoner, and the other prisoner went up in the hills. So by the time I turned and came back, there was two dead bodies on the dock, and they were searching. And the panga got there with the other guards, and they got the other guy up there. And uh, most of the people, the El Nino had hit that year also. We hadn't seen a fish for a while, so I'm like, I'm out of here. We grabbed our stuff. And about six of the guests, they wanted out of there too. So the, the owner of the resort said, will you take them back to the, you know, back there and send me charter and flight? And I said, yeah. So I had all these guests on the boat. We just left that place overnight. So it was quite, but the, the guy from Colorado, he wanted to stay and fish. He goes, the worst is over. I'm staying and fishing. <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite the story. It never really made the papers up there, but the three prisoners, they just fed those of the sharks right there. The sharks around the camp were incredible. We caught thousand pound tiger sharks right off the, right off the beach there. They fed them every day. Well, Raleigh working, working was, uh, God a bless him. yeah, what a great guy. He, uh, he wrote a, uh, a little passage on the back of the book uh, representing the madam and the hooker. And it reads, this book reads like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll of sport fishing. As if growing up in Fort Lauderdale during the late 60s and 70s wasn't enough, taking their show to the high seas, riding a wave that would carry them around the globe, etching their exploits into the record books like a tale from the Wild West with a splash of salt. I mean, that was a, a world of rock and roll craziness. Yeah, well, growing up in Fort Lauderdale, it was, was, <laughs> it was crazy. So we were fishing and coming back to Lauderdale, restocking the boat, running the beach. And the exploits of my brother say it all. I mean, he was... Uh, a, yeah, we're t- so we're talking about Kunta now. Kent, okay. Kent, yeah, Kunta, how he got his name there is in the book. It was crazy, but he was... The, the, the fun didn't stop with him, whether it was what time of day, night, whatever. So I put stories about his exploits in there and his craziness and... Everything happened to him. He ended up 
I think signing more books than I did. All his friends wanted to he was sign a, copy He was a big him. celebrity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I had a, well, tell me about their early years. What is the madam and the hooker? Where I'm talking about these two boats. You can articulate exactly what they were and talk about Jerry uh, and Deborah, the owners. Yep. Jerry Dunaway had a 53 Hatteras when I w- went to work for him. Actually, I turned down the job in the beginning because he had all the bright places but the wrong time of year. And I went, no, no, I was making too much money longlining. And then... Uh, my brother took the job and they ran down to Belize and they needed help getting back from Belize because the mate, other mate quit. So I flew down there with my bad hand, brought the boat home. And next thing you know, as soon as we got to the dock, Captain Jeff Fay from Hawaii got a call at Merritt saying, you got to come home, you're getting divorced. <laughs> so Dunaway asked me if I wanted to run the boat for the summer. I said, yeah, I'll do it for the summer until my hand heals. I'm going back longlining. Well, 11 years later, I still worked for him. So after we had the 53 and we went to we went to Panama in 82, it just wasn't big enough and didn't have enough amenities to really anchor for three months and fish. So we found a 60 Hatteras that had more staterooms, water makers, everything we needed. So then we had a 60 Hatteras called the Hooker. And then in 83, he sold his business and had to sell the boat and he wasn't sure what he was gonna do. So I had to take a, I ran another boat for a little while and then he called me up. He says, I'm building a GNS boat. A 48, you know, come back to work for me and we're going to go do this. I said, yep, I'm back. So I went to Destin and helped build the 48 GNS, the hooker. And we took that on his initial sea trial to St. Thomas. And then we went down to all the way to Grenada through all the islands. We went to Venezuela. And then from Venezuela, I went to Panama to Tropic Star Lodge. So that was the beginning of 86. And we caught all those swordfish records. We caught four records in a week on light tackle. One of the best trips we ever had. And we were sitting there, and the water flipped over, and fishing got slow. What does that mean to the audience out there, flip over? It, you go from 80, 82 degree water, beautiful blue water, to all of a sudden you've got all this green water out there, and it feels like it's about 70 degrees. So whether the water rolls over, the currents roll it upside down, and they put the cold water on top and the hot water down, but it's, just, it's probably just a saying, it flips over, but all of a sudden it's green water, cold water moves in. And the fish leave. Shuts the fishing down. It's not like they're underneath and you can drop down like you know, snapper fish and right. find marlin. It just pushes all the bait away. And like we talked earlier, the fish follow the bait. If we right. could follow the bait, we'd probably catch more fish. Right. But we follow the fish and then we're at the end of the game. So anyhow, we're sitting there probably drinking too much champagne or something one night. And we said, we need a mothership. And Jim Jenks already had the OP out. He was already doing it with a 30-footer. And Dunaway had saw that, and we said, we need a mothership, Dunaway. We could be out of here. So Dunaway flew home, and he flew to California and looked at uh, tuna boats. And he flew uh, to somewhere in Mississippi and looked at some other boats. And next thing you know, right in Freeport, Texas, right in his backyard, he found the madam. I forget the name she had on her before. And he bought it right then. So he bought that thing in about, it was about April, and took it right to Swift Ships and and. By December the same year, Swift Ships had that boat converted, done, and a dry dock on the back deck. So now we had the Madam and the Hooker. And then we had some jet skis and a windsurfer. And I had kept all the names within the <laughs> within the, the Hooker theory. The boss wasn't into hookers. He just loved the name Hooker. And when he saw it, so I So originally was, that was uh, the Hooker uh, connotation about hooking, hooking fish. Yeah. Well, he liked the crossover with the girl and the logo because he saw that in Australia on a boat. And he called the owner of the boat in Australia and asked him if he could use that name. And the guy says, sure, you're in the U.S. You use right. whatever you want. So Jerry ended up having the logo trademarked and everything after a while. So we had the hooker, the madam, and we had the John, which was the, was the jet ski. <laughs> and the quickie was the other jet ski. So I named the windsurf for the blowjob to go along with it. <laughs> How apropos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even though Jerry was, in the, Jerry was in the TV rental business, he was one of the first um, people renting appliances and stuff there in Texas. And they went huge. I mean, they, they, they sold their company for millions. They were GE's biggest customer wow. at one time in the early 80s. So, I mean, that's how Jerry made his money. And then Jerry met Deborah, and Jerry was married at the time to somebody else. And he met Deborah and became a girlfriend on the side because his wife didn't like fishing. So, Deborah Fish was all those years as Deborah Maddox. And then years later, he got divorced and married Deborah. And uh, she's got quite a voice. She got quite a scream. That's right. Uh, when Marlin come yeah. up, she would let out a scream that I think would scare away half the Marlin. But <laughs> for some reason, those Marlin stayed chasing that soft head. So, but how awesome is that? I mean, you've got an owner and a fisherman with that owner that wanted to travel the world and go catch fish. It must have been a dream come true for you. 
It was. I was really into the traveling, planning those trips. And when when he got, when we were in Australia when he got. He told me I had to bring the boats home, and uh, he was getting divorced. The boats were going to be put up for sale, and we already had plans to go through the whole Indian Ocean to go to Madagascar, and Mauritius, and Seychelles, and I wanted to go through the uh, the the, the canal and come out over there and put the boat on the French Riviera, <laughs> that ugly duckling madam. This, I want to go up to the Suez, you know, and then come out there and do the Azores and all that stuff. But we got to Australia, and that was 1990. And he said, take the boats home. So we went to Tahiti, and, you know, my dream was over because the traveling was over. I was right. like, what am I going to do? And uh, next thing you know, he ended up, getting divorced and have enough money to keep them at him. But he it was very limited until he got a partner on the boat. It kind of wiped him out. Right. But then he traveled all over again and went to Madeira and caught all these great fish. And I was like bummed. I happened to have a kid then and I was really retired. And you really wanted to go to Madeira. Oh, yeah. I went to Madeira and fished with Stuart Campbell, actually. So you saw the good stuff. Yeah, I got the fish with him. Talk about Madeira and the magic of that, of that place. I only got the fish there for a week, Stuart, as a guest. But... When that place went off, it was like a dream come true for everybody because there was nowhere in the Atlantic that you could catch that many thousand-pound blue marlin. It was crazy the first years of that place, how it went off, and all the graners that were killed, all the graners that were released. It was just magic. I mean, the Azores had a good reputation, but Madeira just took over the world for why did for they graners. have? Why did they hold so many big fish? Do you have any idea? Just following the bait in there. Uh-huh. Just when when they caught all those fish, they said there was a lot of scabbard fish, like a ribbon fish, you know, that were down deep. And the boats would come out there and catch all these squid. There was giant tunas all over. You know, it was crazy with all the different fish that were there. But I think it's up to the current gods, really. You know, it seemed like that when you got certain currents and it was pulling the bait there, and the, yeah. and the big fish followed. Yeah. Is there any other place in the world that was like Madeira? Azores was close to it. They caught quite a few big fish, but um, uh, Ivory Coast was known for a few big fish. They had more granders in Madeira than anywhere else in the world. Am I I not mistaken? I don't know about anywhere else in the world. In the Atlantic, yeah. I'd have to separate the Atlantic from the Pacific because I'm a split ocean guy. Right. But the magic of Madeira was fairly calm water, and they had a lot of big fish. Yep, and everybody loved the town. There's something about it that they enjoyed. That they made a lot of good friends over there. The people there were very good to them. The food was great. Anytime you go to anywhere and you get good food, the water's safe and the fishing's great and it's calm. Just people live fall there. in love like Kona. Yeah. Buy buy a house, buy a dock, right? When you when you read that book uh, in the heart of the sea with those ships that used to go whaling, they used to leave Nantucket and go to Madeira. To, to stock up on water and, and wine, I guess, even back then, and then sailed all the way down to the uh, Cape Horn. Interesting. It's crazy, yeah, that yeah. Madeira was on the map even back then for the sailing ships. What was it like as a captain? Could you tell when the ocean was right? Could you tell that you were going to get a bite anytime soon? Well, number one, you're fishing in the right areas, but, you know, whether you're marking bait or the birds or the waters is purple, when the, when I used to always look for like purple water. So when I was in Chub K, you'd find blue water up in the pocket. But sometimes you'd find over towards, um, what's the name of that place over there? Over towards Andros, I found this purple water and we'd get bites in it. For some reason, we didn't really have good temperature gauges back then. We really weren't watching that. But just reading the waters, you always feel that way. And Or you know, you get out there and you find that little rip I found rips before where it's just blue and then to a purple. And I'd say, Captain, I was a guest on this boat. I said, stay right on this edge. He goes, what edge? On the purple edge. And so he whether, never saw it. Whether they're colorblind or they couldn't see it, I mean, I don't know. But, you know, you'd f- find that little better looking water. And now we can find it easier with temperature gauges and and uh, you find more bottom structure with the machines that help you out a lot. But finding that brighter water is always always better there's something about it reading the waters let's go back real quickly to you were talking about going to you know you were in australia and you wanted to travel around the world with these boats the madam and the hooker what was it like what were the voices in your head like in the middle of the night traveling across these big oceans thousands of miles and and what was the fear and apprehensions like did it scare you ever no 
like I said, I, I, I had a good security detail on everybody that was on watches while you're in transit. You get to certain areas, you might you might keep a better watch. You know, like put two people on watch and, you know, watching that radar. And But no, when you had a trip planned out, we, we hired a guy when we got to Australia because I, I was looking on the chart and Vanuatu looked like a good place, New Guinea looked like a good place, and the Solomon Islands looked like a good place. So we hired a guy to fly there and check them all out to find out, you know, what facilities and if we're going to be allowed to fish there. And this was back in the 80s. And the guy came back and his report said, you don't want to take the boat there. They don't like white people. And having a big American vessel like that wouldn't work out. And now Vanuatu is one of the hottest spots out there. New Guinea has been really good because the guy that we gave the award to is in, uh, the legendary captain. Right. He's made New Guinea very famous for their billfish. And they've come about over the years. But at the time, that's a report we got. So, you know, I wanted to go there. So, so if I had to go to a place like that, my head would probably be more of a, on a swivel. You know, going to Peru, I felt very safe at. You need the president on the boat. We had all sorts of officials, yeah. Yep. And the, and the, we had a one, one of the president's guards. He, he, he even flew to Venezuela and helped me take the boat to Africa. So, I mean, you know, he, he fell in love with this. Jose Rada was his name. Oh, I popped in my head. Um, but when we were anchored off of there, we, we, right off the bat, we did a show and it was like, uh, life in the rich and famous for Peru. Right. So they had all the cameras on the boat. They showed the beautiful interior, the madam kind of looks like this place, you know, <laughs> fish mounts and art all over the place. So they did a thing on that and they showed the fishing and they were trying to promote fishing in Peru. Well, well, it aired, it aired about a month later and the next morning I get up and here's the, the, the official panga from the port captain of, of uh, Mencora. And he's got his stripes on, his hat on, you know, he's official looking captain and everybody else uniforms and some guns and they come on board. And they said, uh, we're sorry to tell you, but last night the show aired and the, and the revolutionary group called The Shining Path called them and said, they're gonna be dead by tomorrow morning. So they didn't like Americans there. They were kind of a communist group that was trying to overtake Peru. So I said, we'll see, we'll see you later. And we loaded the hooker onto the dry dock while we're anchored off the beach. So we're in the ocean, basically. We got the hooker up on the dry dock and then get fitting under the madam was very tough, even in very calm water. And I don't know how we didn't lose arms and legs and fingers, but we got her up on the back deck that afternoon. And the next morning I was in Talara, I think it was Talara, getting fuel and I was out of there. They weren't gonna find me in Cabo Blanco. And, you get the message. Uh, yeah, I called Dunaway in a sideband and said, hey, if you want your boat, it's going to be in Ecuador or somewhere else. We're out of here. What was it like traveling? What, what kind that of pain? was scary. Yeah, I, I can see that because uh, the dre- death threats in certain parts of the world are real. Yep. And Especially they came to warn America. you. Yeah. It's like, if you die, we warned you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what was it like? Uh, we'll get into the world record fishing here in a second, but one last question. I, I found that trying to drive across the country, all the way across the country, nonstop, 30 some hours with no sleep, is really brutally painful. What was it like when you're traveling in the big ocean and you got a long way to go and there's no ch- you, you can't sleep, you are exhausted, but yet you, you've got a big road ahead of you? When we were traveling with just the, the game boats before we had the madam, those were the 30 hours and whatever, you just get a cat nap here or there for an hour, just enough to knock the edge off you. And uh, the rough seas, you never feel like you're sleeping. If you got to go up sea, like going from uh, Caicos directly to St. Thomas, 600 miles up sea. 600 miles up sea. I, I think it's five or six, somewhere near. I don't think it's 600. I think I'm wrong. I think it's, it's ominous. I think it's about 500. But you're going into six to 10 foot seas oh. the whole way. Just boom, 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 the constant pounding. So you're hardly getting any sleep at all for 48 hours. But even today, now I'm going out to the sea mounts off of Costa Rica and you get up at, you know, you take a watch, you know, from two to four and then you're back up at five o'clock, you know, so you get about three, four hours sleep a night. But I'll tell you what, the fishing takes over. It's worth it. Yeah. The fishing adrenaline and now all of a sudden you're up at five in the morning or you, you get done at dinner at eight o'clock and nine o'clock. You've had the longest day of your life. But you can't, you take your watch, but you're ready to go fish the next morning. I What's mean, it like for you the guys? The fishing takes over. It gives you the energy. 
What's it like to to be in an area like that? And you're a captain. You see that the man come up in the spread, and, and it's a monster fish worth a lot of money or a tournament win. Your knees shake. You, your stomach gets tight. Like in Australia, when you're looking down from the tower and you see that thousand pounder tailing down sea or coming up on the long rigger. I mean, it, it puckers you. But it seems like you know when I'm fishing, when I was mating for like Peter Wright or something, he's as calm as can be. He's seen plenty. It depends on you know how many how many you've seen but for me it was always knee shattering and and ready and the, you know the adrenaline kicks in and you know you might just say you know a real one on the long rigger right long you know been everybody, a real one meaning a big one yeah but i've seen dunaway just shaking like this dunaway how many have you caught you know a great dunaway story was he wanted to catch a 16 pound pacific record and this is after i'd got off the boat but jerry called me to tell me the story how big of a fish was that that you needed he said he only needed about a 600 pounder and he had a brand new 16 pound rod built so he's got the rod the reel trevor says you know you know 600 pounder 16 because usually the captain would tell us you know like what i did what i taught him is like throw the 16 you know big fish on the left side so jerry says he goes back there and he takes the bait out of the cooler throws it over the side and he was always nervous for some reason. He was just one of those type of people. And he said that the fish came up and ate it. And he said he went to give him the perfect drop back, you know, the real light thumb. And he relaxed his hand so much, the rod fell over the side. So the, everybody's watching the bite. And all of a sudden, they say, Jerry turned around and walked inside. <laughs> they didn't see him it was <laughs> relax his hand so much <laughs> that the rod. And everybody's like, what happened? <laughs> he gave the rod to the marlin. <laughs> you relax in your hand so much and, and the nerves, <laughs> he dropped the rod over the side. I've heard of a couple like that. but I, I've heard uh, this statement before. And, um, and I can see how it might be accurate in a lot of ways where... As an offshore boat and captain, that captain catches more of the fish than the angler does. Is that true? No, you, you, you go on the flats. It's all a hunt. So, you know, the guide may put you in the right area for that. But there's so much to it overall. I mean, Stuart Campbell was one of the guys I really looked up to because he would tie his own knots, right. set his own drags. He could rig his own bait if he had to. But you got, here you got a mate that's got a rigged the bait, and they might have had to make up the leader. They had to twist the wire, do the crimps. Everything's got to be perfect. There's, right. Everybody's got a job. And like I said earlier, my job was to keep that boat running, to keep us out there every day. We didn't have engineers, and we didn't have Jeff Gordon pit stops back then where you could bring your boat in, right. in the middle of the ocean. So between the boat, being able to do what you needed to do, respond correctly, and, and the angler to be able to present the bait that the mate rigged, and the captain to be able to drive the boat and keep you close, People used to ask me, Skip, what's the trick to catching all their records on light tackle? I said, well, you really want the answer? And they said, yeah. I said, have enough money to keep trying it till you catch keep one. Keep doing it. <laughs> so th there's uh, so many factors that go into it. It's not like you're just wading out in a lake, you know, and throwing a worm by yourself or, you know, that you tied on. I mean, that's great accomplishments. I've always appreciated an angler that can do it all, tie their own flies and have everything ready to go. You show up with all your flies and your, and your rods and reels are all done and the you jump on somebody else's boat. You you did you did all that, right? The guy but, still helped you. But let me ask you here. So you cut a, you guys cut a lot of really big record stuff. Uh, let me just kind of go through this a little bit because the the, the list is is quite phenomenal. Um, about the light tippets, uh, we're talking. What was your record on four pound test? The One, first blue marlin we ever caught on four pound was about eighty seven pounds on four but, pound test. But but you know, like Stewart had already lost sixty or seventy fish at the time on four pound, couldn't catch one. We had already lost twenty or thirty. So to be able to to, to, to do that, the first one we caught on eight pound, the, the first marlin Atlantic marlin caught on eight pound was by a lady Ruth Stokey out of the Caymans. Jerry caught the first one ever on eight pound, and I forget how big it was. I think it was like one forty three. And then we broke his record with another charter with Mark Gerard, who was a great light tackle angler. And he caught one about 180. And Jerry couldn't wait to break that one. And then we caught one 200. And then we caught some and let him go on eight pound, which <laughs> Barky Garns is like, I never heard, a, could ever believe someone's tagging and releasing fish on eight pound, Blue Marlin. So we kept breaking our own record going up. And then we wanted to catch one on four. because so I think the six pound record was out for a while. Then they reinstated it. Um, so we were fishing four because it was open. 
and we caught that fish, I thought it would last forever. Then someone went to the Azores, and they catch a 500 and whatever cluster, and caught like a 560 on, on four pound. So how do you catch a 560 pound marlin on four pound test? The, the, the secret that we didn't know at the time was when you're fishing those colder waters up there, the fish are more lethargic and stay up on the surface more and you get a shot at them like that. So you back down on them and throw a gaff in them? Is that how it's done with that much? You try to stay close to them. You can't put any pressure on that fish. You basically try to stay as close as you can to them. When you get the leader, the leader is so over pound test. It might be 800 pound mono, might be double twisted wire. And the mate just basically hands on. Because you on only got 15 foot of leader now when you're fishing that. So it's only about a handful and your gaffs can go in. And I got the video of that fish that the guy caught. And it's just amazing. And, and, and what they did is the bait presentation is a big part of it. Those guys did a big giant squid with two 14 hooks in it. So when it got in his they throat. They swallow the hook because you can't set the hook with two pound test no, or four pound test. No. Usually it gets jammed around in there some way. It makes the fish uncomfortable. It makes him come up, shake his head and you try to get to him with a boat. But I've had some fights where, just unbelievable fights where the you know you got two three hundred yards of eight pound out, you know, and the big belly in the line. The, the line drag alone would break that usually. If I showed you the video of Marg Love's fish he caught on four pound, it's a crazy blue marlin that we caught in the Pacific. It's still a record. Right now, I'm mad at myself. I can't remember the the weight. Does that um, fish jump at all? You oh. think one jump, they're going to break four? It jumped three times going straight away from the boat. And how big is this fish? I, I think it's one, maybe 140, somewhere in there. I might have to grab the book I and look it up. I can't even believe But the fish jumped three times going away, and most of the time we broke the line then, right. just because it was doing probably about 15 miles an hour, just greyhounding. That's all the speed really is, 15 to 20, because so I've kept up to them. So it jumped three times straight away, and then it did a hard left and jumped. And then it went and did another right. So you got that belly, that line through there, and how that four pound, and I got the video, how it survived. And you can hear me yell at the angler, almost in free spool, almost in free spool. Right. So when you're only fishing one pound of drag all the way up, maybe a pound and a half, and you back the drag off, you're basically in free spool. And that's how we survived it. 12, um, that fight was, we hooked that fish about nine or 10 in the morning, and we caught it nine that night. So I think it was 12 hours. Yeah, I think it was about 10 hours. I think we didn't find it, hook that fish till about noon. I just can't even believe you can hang on to a fish it, that big with four pound test for 12 hours and I have something wrong. wrong if happen. you would have seen the machine, I was marking layers of squid as it got dark. We ended up catching the fish at nine at night. You could see the squid layer coming up and we had goo on the line like jellyfish. I don't know how the squid didn't hit it. It was just, it was all in the, someone else's hands because it wasn't us. But when we gaffed that fish, that fish hardly, we got him on the deck and hardly flopped. She beat that fish on four pounds. With That's insane. One, That's... one to two pounds of drag on there. The leader pounding against his tail, you know. I don't get it. That is a magical that, catch. To my, that, that's one of my favorite records. Um, she caught it on this boat. That was 1989, so it should be in there. So as an or... angler, so here's, so here's the question. You know, originally stems from the question, does the captain catch that fish or does the angler catch that fish? 162 on four pounds. That's insane. That's crazy. But so, so as as an angler, what can she do other than reel to catch that fish? And you have got to chase that fish with the boat. So therefore, I'm thinking it might be a little bit more important to have a great captain to, who can run a boat to catch that fish. Not, I don't want to take any, you know, kudos away from from Deborah catching that fish. I mean, that's her world record, but it's yours too. But I'm thinking you had a hell of a lot to do with that catch. There was a lot that we learned all together, you know, on how to present the bait right to get the fish to eat the bait correctly, you know. And what was the key of that to that aspect of it? It was... And we'll get back to that previous question. It was really when we came up with the bait and switch to get that fish so hungry and chasing the bait that it would eat a tennis shoe no matter what you threw out there. So here you, you you got this fish teased up and he's just absolutely going crazy. Like, what in the heck is that? I want to grab a hold of it and see what it is. He's chasing the lure to the boat. And then you got a skipping bonita or a mackerel. Right. And it's like, boom. And when a, when a marlin eats it, they give it a quick squeeze. They pop their gills and head first, it shoots right down their gullet. They turn the bait? Yeah. So you got a head rig bait. And if you can get them so crazy and then they got a bonita something they're familiar with now they see it grab it they go wow pow and it's down in a second so now you got a head rig bait down on the inside with a j-hook yeah 
And so just that little bit of pressure doesn't let it come back out. The sphincter closes of his throat and won't let the bait release back out. So now you got a fish on. He's got a he's got a heavy leader, makes him uncomfortable, and they stop, shake their head sometimes. But we didn't get too many of those no brainers. We didn't catch but one world record that was kind of a back up and catch you it. You got it. Yeah. All the rest was one hour fights, two hour fights. We had so many long fights that the line would get out there, and it was angler. Uh, the angler comes in now. I can't back straight down. You know, if you if you and I decide to go to Alaska in a stream and catch a twenty two pound trout on two pound, it's only got two foot of water. You don't have any line out. It's just right. a matter There's of no dodging liner. trees and sure. rocks and running down a thing. We're out there in 5,000 feet of water. That fish can go down and take two, 300 yards out and then get a belly in it. So for the angler to be able to, to be patient and just get inches at a time, you know, with very little drag when it lines out, we're backed way off. And just be patient, getting that belly out, getting that belly out, and the fish just gets into a mode where it's probably like walking a old dog or something and you're chasing that belly with the boat we're barely backing up half the time you look at the videos and we're just barely in gear just because that's all the fish is doing the fish has now gone into a mode that is just doing two or three knots and so you know we're just getting that belly out the belly out then all of a sudden that fish feels that that leader along his lateral line across his eye after a while the fish goes you know, wants to come back up because now the belly's getting underneath them. He thinks that we're pulling from underneath them. So he comes up. Comes yeah. back up. But now we got to just be patient, patient, get that belly out. And once in a while, they just come up and make a move near the surface to where they shake their head. We get the leader out of the water. And if you look at the times of some of those records, like I said, hour, two hours on that light tackle is incredible. So it does take great angling skill and patience. Jerry was very patient. He didn't like going up on the drag. Stuart Campbell, he loved to heat. He would be up there at eight pounds on 16 in no time where Jerry would leave it at four for a couple hours and just be patient. You know what's crazy? Because I, I, I too, I, I've only world record fished once. And I was trying to catch a, a, a world record tarpon on six pound test. And the record was 82 and a half. It was uh, Stu App's record. And so what I did, I put a pulley system in my garage and filled it with five pounds of dirt and stood back. And when, I wanted to feel what five pounds was because I felt that once that fish stopped jumping and I put five pounds of pressure on him, right away five, and fight aggressively, why wait a number of hours to put any heat on the fish? Let's go get him, let's fight him really hard. I caught a fish that was 82.4 in 27 minutes on six. And I got friends that are trying to catch this world record fish on six, and they've been fighting these fish for like 14 hours into the middle of the night, you know, all night. Um, so I'm more of the school, if I'm fishing, Six pound, I'm going to put five pounds of drag right away. Let's go get them or break them off. Or 16 pound test like in the tarpon tournaments, I want to put right away, once they stop jumping, 12, 12 and a half pounds of pressure right away and break his spirit. Chase that fish down and get him. And it's been really effective for me for a long time. So I don't understand, you know, using only four or five pounds of drag when you have 16 pound test tippet. Why wait? Is there a reason for that? No. But, but in theory, when you skied down the mountain and you got to the bottom, you were pretty damn tired. Same thing with a fish. You're thinking the right way. That fish has jumped. He's tired right now. He's used up all his energy. He's going to stop and get a second wind or breath. You put the heat on him right then and there, you can catch him. I love an angler that loves heat. But Let's it's just, go get him. Yeah. So I don't mind pushing it all the way up there. People go, how much drag do you put on four? I said, I go up to two pounds. So, you know, that's 50%. You know. If I could go to 75, I would, but we, the depth of water keeps us from doing that. Right, right. But anytime you can put the heat on. And the thing I love doing myself, if you give me the rod, I go to sunset and put my hand on it. I want to break the line when I'm fun fishing. I want to know how much my tackle can take. I want to know how much I can put on there in case you have to. I want to know where the rod is. So when angler, when I'm as a captain, I see your rod bending. I can say, man, he's three quarters. He's up there. Because that's my job is to know when to back off and when to put the heat on right so we were fighting a big marlin one day on 30 and the rod's bending and the guy's putting his hand on there and it's it, we're living through it so i went down to the cockpit and i put another rod and rod holder i bent it over the scale and so i'm matching the rod i said you got 12 pounds of pressure in that 30 and all of a sudden he bent it over more you got 17 on there we're good you know so i was matching it so i could know what where we were at with the right. angler because he wasn't that experienced so I do crazy things like that to where I know where the rod is, how much it can take. I want to know how good our knots are, our tackle is. 
to be able to put full heat when we need it. So me as an angler, I'm putting heat on. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because uh, when I was uh, tournament fishing, uh, most of the tournaments in the Gold Cup was 16-pound test tippet. So once I started getting the hang of catching fish, if a guide says, you know, pull harder, what does that mean? And how do you do it? And I wanted to learn how to how to catch these fish quicker. So if somebody were to say, you know, put 12 pounds of pressure on that fish, unless you know what 12 is, you have no idea where you're going to go with it. Mm-mm. So that's why I built a scale and wanted to know in my garage what 12 was because I couldn't catch enough fish to learn what 12 was. Nowadays, fishing in the Keys, you're lucky to catch a fish or two a day. And I asked Stu Apt. I said, Stu... Um, we were messing around in the backyard. I got a scale out. I said, uh, what do you normally fish uh, as far as resistance? At what point? He said, I like 12, 12 pounds. And he pulled back and I said, okay, give me 12 pounds. And I had a scale. And he, re- he went right to 12. And I realized that in his day, in his generation, they could catch so many fish and break so many off. They knew what that breaking point was because of how many fish they were catching and hooking. But I think you're exactly right. If you don't know what that breaking point is as an angler, you're always in that no man's land, that gray area. Yeah, you're just waiting for an opportunity instead of really trying to do what you do what we believe in anyhow. Right. I mean, it's amazing that a guy can pick up a fish and go, oh, this thing weighs 30 pounds. I mean, people have that much experience. Well, Stu is doing the same thing. He's got his hand out here. He just knows what the weight is. Exactly right. You might be doing it the same way, plus... You having all the same tackle, you know the bend of the rod is, everything else. It's like, okay, that's about 12. It feels like 12. The rod's usually a 12 when I did all that homework. And that's what I do in the boat. I use sinkers all the time for my weights to test it. So I know when the rod is at one pound, two pounds on the light tackle. I've caught uh, five swordfish now on six pound, trying to get the six pound record. And we keep- And how much line are you pulling up with six with the swordfish? Uh, on four, I'm fishing about a pound and a half to start out with and on six i'm fishing about three to start out with right because six can go to almost seven six point six right we go right. kilos so i started really about two and a half but we've caught um five out of six on uh, swordfish doing that we've caught them we missed one by putting that much pressure on them on light tackle out here and you know in 1500 feet of water I can't believe that. A hundred feet of water, that light of tackle, you I would think that there's no way you're gonna be able to get that fish up to the boat. Yeah. Yep. No, we've caught I've got the uh, right now as a captain when we hold a four pound record, the uh the men's four pound, and we fought that from a dead boat the whole time. Never had to move the boat. I was joking with the angler, like I was laying down the bridge saying, Boy, this is really hard on me and then all of a sudden there's the light stick. <laughs> you know, I'm, I used to think that uh, some of the uh, fly fishing, you know, records were pretty impressive and I think one of the biggest and best is uh, Tom Evans' hundred and ninety four pound tarpon on uh twelve pound test. Crazy. But when I look at what you guys have caught, I mean four hundred pound marlin on this light tackle. I mean I think the world record is like the biggest difference is 400 on four, is that correct? 500 something of men's four pound by, by Klosterman up in the Azores, yeah. 500 pound fish on four pound test. Yeah. Is that uh, aggressively backing down and grabbing the leader? They just go up there in that colder water and got a big fish up there and I don't know what the fight time was on it. Um, but in the video, it, it didn't, it, the fish looked like it just ran off a ways and started gagging and they got the leader and got the gaps in it and it was over. Just those fish Crazy. get real lethargic in that colder water. If I'd have known that, I wouldn't have spent all the time in the Caribbean that we did. I would have said, boss, we need to be up there. Cold water. Yeah. <laughs> How, what was more important for you guys, uh, the records or the tournaments? Well, when we first started, it was all about the tournaments. We had some great seasons over there in Texas and even the Bahamas. We did real well. And then as we went down and started catching numbers, Jerry wanted to start catching records. And we had to figure out how to catch these these records on this light tackle that IGFA opened up because all those other big fish that have been records for years or you know once in a lifetime opportunity right so when the records opened up we had to start catching fish on 16 and 8 pound and had to start learning all by ourselves like I said there was no information it was all R&D or trial and error and uh you know we caught some big ones we lost a lot bigger ones of course the big ones always get away <laughs> <laughs> It seems There's always like, a bigger one, right? Oh yeah, well you know, it's a hell of a challenge to try to catch something like that on light tackle. But the things we, the the time we spent learning all that time to go back and do it again, 
with the information I got, I went back and tried last year again and tried record fishing for the first time in 25 years. We went down to Tropic Star. We caught and released a blue marlin on eight pound. <laughs> we killed one that was just a few pounds under the record, the women's record. So we caught one about 160 on, on eight pound. Um, we fought some 600s on on eight. <laughs> wow. We uh, The angler was really good. I really enjoyed fishing this guy. He's full pressure. Full pressure, man. He goes right up. I enjoy it. And if he loses one, his spirit never breaks. He's just like, let's go again, guys. We're done. He's like, damn, you know, and people be inside. And I'm like, guys, we're light tackle fishing. There's no Dude. rules. Nobody's done this before. Yeah. We're supposed to break them off. Yeah. Yep. yep. Nobody's but, ever caught this. But they get so close and people just get that way. But I, I right. remind them that nobody's ever done this. We're first ones to do all this stuff. And now to do it again, uh, I think I got such an advantage because of all that. You know I've how learned. to do it. Yeah. 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 There's some tricks in it. There's no doubt about it you know things i've earned that i don't want to talk about i want to keep them for myself until i until they bury me and then someone does told anybody me, else know this secret that you have well my crews they know <laughs> what what's the greatest innovation that you guys uh you know came up with i think the bait and, and that switch, might be one of the secrets you don't want to no nah, no nah, the, the, the bait and switch was the whole secret behind catching the world records like we did especially there's there's about four factors here Number one, I had a male and a female angler, so any fish was usually available for a record. We very seldom ever killed a fish that wasn't a record. You know, we weren't under. I was very good at calling the weight. You know, the size of the weight with just a quick view of the fish, I could tell you about how big it was from the bridge, not even the tower. But the biggest thing, what happened to us when we first started record fishing on Tropic Star, the mahi were so bad, you couldn't pull a bait. So here we were trying to pull like a 16 on a lure out of the rigger or whatever, you know, record fishing. And the mahi were so bad we couldn't troll. Right. So I said, just put lures out. just Hookless uh, lures. Yeah, on, on, on the rods long, and then we fished the short teasers. And we kept the baits in the bait box ready to go. So the mahi would come in there and eat the teaser, eat the teaser, boom, there's a black marlin. Throw the whatever. So that's how the bait and switch really started. And then once we got to a place like St. Thomas, we put the 16s in the riggers with the lures and we caught some fish and we wasted time on fish that weren't records. And I'm like, let's just do that teaser thing. Let's just do the teaser thing and, and bait and switch them, bait and switch them. And that's how it all started. And so in St. Thomas, when I was done fishing, everybody was using 80s and you know 130s to catch these strong blue marlin. And then when I retired and came back to fish with Jim Lambert, I walk down the dock and I see 30s and 50s, but no big rods. And I see everybody with teaser rods with a lure crimped right to the tip. So everybody was bait and switching here 20 years later. It changed the Eddie whole Herbert fishing. and uh, Lambert. Every, everybody, everybody on the dock, though, on the way to the boat, I was seeing boat after boat down the dock with just 280s, but with teaser short rods hanging off there. And then they got 30. So now everybody scaled down to enjoy the fish better. If right. the smaller fish, they throw the 30, a bigger fish, 50, and they're enjoying the fight and the fish. and really challenging themselves catching fish on lighter tackle, which the bait and switch enabled everybody to do. And that came from you? That came from, yep, Jerry Dunaway and myself, Jerry's money and, and, and our hard work. <laughs> A lot of passion. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's the best fish you guys ever caught, if there is such a one fish? That 164 and four pounds, my favorite record. My other favorite records are the, uh, we went to uh, uh, Cape Town and fished out of False Bay there. And we caught uh, a couple of swordfish records. We caught a, like a 260 on 12 and a 280 on 20. And those two swordfish records being that big are just incredible catches. It was just a catch of a lifetime. We're fishing off Cape of Good Hope. And, you know, where ships break apart, we're out there drifting our squid out there. And uh, it was incredible fishing. We How caught, rough was that? The nights were magic out there. There was like a leftover swell. The, the, the captains were incredible. We were, we were in the middle of the base. We had a mountain range to the east and the west. And the captains would go look at it and say, yeah, see the clouds? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be blowing. We're not going tonight. This is first thing in the morning. And that afternoon, we'd go down to the boat, wind blowing. And then we'd go out the next morning, and he'd look up. He goes, now see the way the clouds are not forming over here? And he'd look back and forth. I said, you want to be a weatherman in South Florida? <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, he said, we're going. And we went out, and there was like a leftover swell. And the one night we did catch a record, he said it was going to be questionable. We'd probably get a little bit. And But by the time we caught that record, it was so rough getting in. We were taking seas over the, starred, the starboard side that it got inside the window, got an electric panel, and started a fire. We're on the way in. Oh, my Lord. 
and we shut down everything, got the fire out. I went and grabbed a bunch of life jackets. And I, the first thing I did was hung uh, asylums. So we had running lights because there were ships coming by everywhere. <laughs> so I hung hot asylums so we had running lights. And then I went and put a life jacket on the swordfish because I donated my life jacket because I wanted her to get that to the dock because that was one hell of a record. You put a life jacket <laughs> on a swordfish. My life jacket went to the swordfish. <laughs> All the other life jackets in case something happened. Who knows? You know, you, we had no you, idea. Did you think that you were actually going to sink and burn? Uh, I was more of afraid of a ship running us over because we got the fire out. But now it was just getting everything repowered up, the engines, and fighting with the South Africans. To, you know what I thought was right, but it was their boat, so they would run the boat in and out, and I had the controls afterwards. We fought one swordfish for, I think we broke them off at ten in the morning, so it's probably fourteen hours maybe, on sixteen pound. It was a really big swordfish. We got to see her a couple times. And I was backing up so hard on this poor old, I think it was a Ray Davis boat, that I tore the swim platform off. So now we had holes in the back of the boat where the swim platform came off. <laughs> we had water come in the whole time with the, with the swim platform laying next to me on the deck in the salon. I was, I was running it from the lower station. And uh, an angler falling asleep, trying to wake up and wind. And, but we ended up broke, breaking them off. Nice big fish. Wow. But that was a trip of a lifetime. We, we caught a fish on 12. And they were all fishing in the tournament. There was a tournament going on. And we caught a fish on 12, and we were leading the tournament with everybody else fishing 80s. And then the next night, we fought that one all night. So we lost that night. And the third night, uh, the boss said, Skip, go ahead. I brought a 130 with me for a teaser rod. He goes, go ahead. You be the angler tonight. I caught three that night, and I got top angler of the tournament. So if we would have fished the tournament, we probably would have embarrassed the, uh, the competition. And uh, the first one, I got in the chair with my 130. And pushed the drag up and the chair ripped out of the deck. They had it in with just tapping screws. It wasn't through bolting. So now I got a chair sitting on the footrest. I couldn't even lift a rod because of the curved rod butt. And I had the South African kids standing on the back of the chair trying to hold it in place. You're doing and, a stand, uh, you're fighting for your stand up with a chair attached almost, to your back. Almost, I can only I can only lift the rod about six inches. So I was more or less just almost grinding it up. But that was, those records there really stand out. And the four we caught in one week, Swordfish Records and, and Tropic Star, we caught like 20. I never fished past midnight and about eight, ten nights, just going out catching two or three a night off Tropic Star Lodge. It's, it was incredible. What's it like uh, catching a big fish at night? It's nerve wracking as hell trying to see twelve or eight pound test or even twenty pound test from the bridge. We did one of the secrets we had was we were using Strand Line, which tested perfect, and it was a bright orange back then, right. bright yellow. Right. And uh, it was a huge advantage. And with my young eyes, I could see it pretty good. But I'd only have one spreader light on. I shouldn't be telling you this, but because that with their big eye, the light really affects them. So I never see. have two lights on. I'd always fish. I needed I needed some sort of light, so I just put one spreader light on. So what were you looking for when you saw that line? From, well, from, I'm, from... I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to anticipate if the fish, you know, which way the fish is going, because I like keeping the line straight off the transom, straight down. I don't like keeping an angle. That's four foot. I could get maybe and get the leader. Right. So I like keeping the line straight down. So most of the time, you know, after fighting them, that you're usually staying with them pretty close. But you got to be able to see the line so it doesn't hit the boat. Then you know, you but, but definitely keep that don't advantage. want that fish to get to the side of the boat. Yeah, well, I don't care. I, I put the line up the side of the boat sometimes too, because that's if the fish is going that way, that's about an eight foot advantage I can get getting that swivel when it pops up. Hmm. So I'll I'll let the fish go up the side of the boat as long as I think I can stay with them. And sometimes I'll back up so far I can mark them on the machine so I know how deep he is so I can anticipate. So you got to get over the top and mark them. So there's a whole bunch of little things you do as a captain as you learn. Right. Nowadays, you're seeing these guys, they hook blue marlin on 30 pound, and they start going all over the place trying to get them to do something. And they do it right off the bat, where back then I was more patient with them, more patient with them, and then it was time to get them to do something. Because they'll get into a mode like a dog, you know, like a walking a dog, where they don't want to do anything but swim and pull, and especially those big black marlin in Australia. Those captains out there put 60, 70, 80 pounds of pressure on them. They can't move those blacks, those big blacks. They just dog it and dog it and dog it. That's crazy in here. You guys are trying to catch them on four and eight. We're catching them. Six, you are catching them. Yeah, we got the ladies' eight-pound record. We caught like a 231 on eight-pound um, black. That was a great fight. I still remember that like it was yesterday. That was 1987. So you guys were the best in the world at this. We started it. Yeah. You know, there was other people trying it, and there's people that uh, – uh, you know, like Stewart took it to another level, found a better place to catch him, and broke all our records. We caught a 672 on 20 uh, off Ivory Coast. I thought it was going to be a record for a long time. 
We caught a 550 on 30 for a lady. Stuart broke both of those <laughs> in Madeira. Mm -hmm. But I was in the warm waters of the Ivory Coast. Now, that's where I was nervous. <laughs> I was fishing out of, uh, off the Ivory Coast. We moved to a little place called San Pedro, which was near the Liberia border. And for those of you who know anything about Liberia, it's not a nice country. It's right on the corner of, um, of, of uh, the middle of uh, Africa there as you turn up going towards Senegal. And uh, there was a river come out there, and it was gorgeous water, purple water on, on there. Almost, I was in their waters, I believe. <laughs> it was right on the border. My head was on a swivel. But there was whales. There was tunas. There was marlin. It was a great place. But it was about a 40-mile run for me to get there. But I loved going there, but I was always afraid if their gunboat ever came out, right. I didn't want to be in a Liberia you, jail because it was a, they were still having a civil war there. More or less, Ivory Coast was having their own problems back then. So I'm fishing up and on the coast every day. My head was on a swivel. It's it's a it brings on a whole new level of trespassing. Yeah, I was poaching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Skip, tell me you in the book you mentioned about how you had to unscrew a marlin out of the mud. Tell me about that story. I've had a couple marlin go do that. When I first heard about it, I thought it was crazy when these people said the marlin went in the mud. I'm like, what? But anyhow, the first one I had, we were fighting a black marlin on a thirty pound and uh, off Tropic Star. And it's only about 350 feet deep off of the little Zane Gray Reef. And next thing you know, we're fighting this marlin. It might have been four, 400. We're fighting a marlin, and all of a sudden it goes straight down. And I'm looking at the land. I'm looking at the ranges because we didn't have GPS back then. And we're not moving. We're not losing line, nothing. So it's like, man, I think this thing's stuck in the bottom. He's stuck in the mud. So what I did is I pulled away from the fish a little bit to get an angle. And I started making a circle, visualizing in my head the leader going around and maybe cutting into the mud to release the fish. And I knew I had so much leader. So after about two going around, I had to anticipate maybe when it was around his dorsal, around his tail. So I didn't want to do too much where I got the 30 pound into the, right. into the fish to break it off. So then I'd go reverse. I'd do about six laps around because I did three already. So I'd go three the other way. And next thing you know... The fish released out of the mud. And when we got the fish to the boat, it had mud packed in his gills and his eyes and his mouth. So it really did go into the mud. It was the That's first crazy. one I'd actually seen. And, and then, you think he did somehow did it by accident? Or you think he did that some purpose? I think it's a suicidal type tendency to where they're just going to just gonna pull. They're going to go against you, just like teenagers, <laughs> our right. kids do. So Whatever that, we tell them, they do he, the opposite. He ran into a mud wall. <laughs> so they're just going straight down into the dark, whether their eyes adapt in time or not. But I think he's just, just swimming straight down to get away because they're going against the pole of the line. Right. And boom, they hit the mud, whether it gets dark down there. Because you never know. That water could be a dark green down there, colder water. You know, maybe their uh, eyes don't dilate in time. And he's just swimming at four knots, and boom, he hits the mud. He doesn't have a reverse gear either. All they can only go forward. Right. So he's stuck. He's stuck. His air's out of his gills. They're done. And then in Hawaii, we hooked a fish. I think the fish weighed 617. And I was only about 100 fathoms fishing the, the edge right there and uh, near Red Hill. And the fish went down and boom, it was stuck in the mud. And no GPS back in those days. I'm watching, watching. Fish isn't really going anywhere. I said, this fish is stuck. I did the same thing. And I think that was on, that might have been heavier tackle. It might have been 50 or 80. And did the circles back and forth and got him out. And we weighed that fish, 617, all covered in mud. It took about, a, it probably almost took an hour to unscrew, unscrew him. But what I was thinking in my head. Was he dead by the time he got to the fish was dead as a doornail. Yep, yeah. just lift and pull, lift and pull. And, you know, the thinking was that the, if you had enough angle, the leader would cut the mud around the head and, and get rid of that suction that was right, holding them there. Right, right. Because it is just a nasty mud out there. I mean, you never, it was, so I got, that was great thinking by the seat of your pants. Yeah. You get, we got to get the mud away from his face. Yeah. And, it, like, now we can talk about it and, and, you know, get ideas out there to everybody through articles or, you know, magazines. I mean, I haven't seen any articles on fish stuck in the mud, but I'm right. sure a lot of people came across it. Fishing 130, you might be able to pull the fish out of the mud. You might have enough tackle just to, you know, actually pull them out. Right. But when you're fishing a lighter line, you know, I knew that wasn't going to happen. And like I said, just thinking about, you know, the, I don't know, geometry or whatever you'd call it, I knew I had to get such an angle 
to be able to get that leader to maybe go around and start releasing that mud. And that was my theory. Whether it's right or wrong, you know, in this business, it's hard to prove anybody wrong. Right. But um, you just do what you see to your pants. It's interesting that you were just mentioning about the current day sword fishermen using a technique that you used a long time ago. Uh, speak about that. Well, when, when the guys are sword fishing and they've got a 15, or they got an eight pound weight or a, a, a 20 or, or a, a eight pound weight or 15, that's the size weights they use for daytime for dropping down in 15, 1700 feet of water. And they usually have about a hundred foot leader because to be able to get a swordfish to even get the bait in his mouth, you need a longer leader. So you have that length, like a, like mutton fishing, the longer the leader, the fish can, doesn't feel it as much. So you got a hundred foot leader because the, the current that's on top and all the other variables you got going against you out there. But when a swordfish does get hooked up on it and you get tight and that sinker drops below them, well, what happens in, in theory, in my head anyhow, is that the fish feels the pull coming from down below. So these guys are finding out that when a swordfish, the weight gets underneath them, usually the swordfish will swim it up because he feels the pull coming from underneath them. So now he swims at the surface, the guys get the lead off, and then the fight begins. <laughs> now you get them up higher. Yeah, yeah. now they're fighting them regular. You can't pull them out of a hole. But that reverse oh. pull is something I've used to my advantage for many years. So I've had blue marlin on a lure start going straight down like during the mud and i found out if i can let the line go slack and a lot of times i'll the lure go underneath them they'll come back up and go jumping because i reverse the pull and it's so important in, in everyday fishing now out there in deeper water because most of the time i don't care if you're using 12 pound test it's hard to pull a 200 pound blue marlin up so if you get if you use that belly of the line to your advantage by letting it go underneath them sometimes, almost free spooling whatever you got, and let that thing go beneath them, and then slowly push the drag up. Now you're pulling that fish from underneath, and the fish is saying, wait a second, that pull is coming underneath here. And it's like walking an aggressive dog, you know, he's going to pull you. Right. If you get out front of them, what do they do? They stop. <laughs> Turn around and go the other way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So by using that, what I've learned, I've learned it the other way around. These guys are just finding out today that they'll swim the weight up but they're not doing it on purpose. It just happens. But right. it just shows you what a reverse pull will do to a fish to get them back up. So you can use that to your advantage, whether you're fishing any light tackle or even heavy tackle. Like I said, I've used it in tournaments where I was going to get spooled with blue marlin going down, and I free spooled it. The lure got underneath them. Next thing you know, the fish is jumping on the horizon, and I don't have to sit there and watch a fish go down and die or you know sharks or whatever happens when you get straight up and down on, on a decent marlin. What's the next phase of your life? What are you doing now? Right now, I got, uh, believe it or not, the boat we've been talking about, the 48 GNS, which presently has 87 world records to her name. Um, I ended up purchasing that boat and fixing her up, and she's a charter boat down in Capos, Costa Rica, in Marina Pesvela. And I really, really enjoyed fishing again, uh, running the boat. This year on my birthday, we released 21 Blue Marlin in one day, and now I had one motor with throttle the other model didn't have throttles and I, I couldn't imagine what we'd have caught that day if i could have been a little bit more aggressive with the boat but the one thing i'm really proud of fishing again is that i don't back up real fast i don't get anybody wet i don't fish for numbers so if i catch numbers they were, they, were, they were really thick yeah i like to, i like people seeing them jump i like the fight i like when a marlin goes down and starts dogging it and kicks the angler's ass <laughs> I really enjoy seeing a good fight right. instead of a fish just up on the surface and we get the leader. We, I watch other boats just roar back and just the fish hardly jumped and they cut the leader and they, you know, they got another flag. It's a number, up. yeah. So when I catch 21, you know they were thick. They caught. And uh, another trip, we had 42 in three days. So, you know, we are you know, catching like 16 a day or 12 a day. Is that fishing off of fads? Fishing off the sea mounts where there's a underwater fad underneath it. And How has that changed the game of I think it's it's changed the game in many ways to where you, you know catch a bunch of fish. People go out there with expectations of catching ten or twenty, and if you only catch five, they're almost bummed. I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> one's a great one, a great day. Is this good or bad? Uh, it's it's good. It's given people some great experience on tackle where they can really pull and and learn how to pitch bait an aggressive blue marlin bite. So you know the anglers are going to do better. But the interesting part that confuses me, I was on the board with the Billfish Foundation for years, 
and here we think there's you know the blue marlin endangered and all of a sudden people put some seamounts out in the middle of no some fads out in the middle of nowhere and we're catching record numbers i mean there was one seamount last year where each boat four boats at one fad was catching each boat caught 10 a day for i don't know how many days so how many marlin were there they're catching 10 they're missing four or five a day so that's 15 times that's 60 marlin for four boats i mean and every day they were catching that so we don't even know i don't think we know how many marlin are really out there because they're such a pelagic species i mean when, i've right. done a lot of satellite tags and you know we tag them out the bahamas and they go to africa they swim across i mean there's plenty of food for them on the thermocline so they, they can eat all their way over there if there's not food i don't know what their stamina is to be able to go days without feeding who knows we don't right. get that information but by seeing the numbers of fish coming off those fads in the Pacific, I, I just don't think we have a clue how many fish are out there. And then if you go another 100 miles from where we're fishing, there's a long line of, uh, uh, just on the outside of the boundary, uh, the conservation zone, uh, the country zones, it's 200 miles. There's long line boats of all sorts out there. And so they're catching tons of fish out there. So we don't even know, you know, to get a count on if they're endangered or not. We don't have a clue. It's just amazing number of fish. And most of our fish are 150 to 300 pounds. So they're decent sized fish. Right. They're not quite the breeders. Late in the season last year, I saw a couple of bigger fish at the end. So it might just be the time of year. I'm going out next weekend. So I'm going to go out in December to see what's going on out there. We'll see if they're thinned out or if they're out there or not. So. Kunta was a really big part of this team that you guys had on the Madam and the, and the Hooker, your brother. He started Jerry on record fishing. They were at a, a rig record fishing when I wasn't there. I think Kunta rode with him, and he brought a rod with like six pounds. He goes, I want to catch a record and six pounds. Jerry's like, that's pretty interesting. So that's how Jerry got into record fishing. But tell, tell me about your brother. He was a wild man from what I understand. Oh, yeah. This could be a long story. Um, Kent was his name and he was kent in the beginning he didn't get named kunta until uh, 1980 but he was just a average kid he, actually as a kid he was unbelievable he took care of owls and birds he had a hawk he was just the best kid in the world all through school and something happened <laughs> and, yep yep and then his he uh he found out about sex and drugs and rock and roll and as he started running the beach, he got a reputation for with the women. He was just had a, what hit, just for some reason he had the right attitude, so he always had a, a craving for crazy women. And as we went forward, he never drank. He liked to smoke weed occasionally, and and next thing you know, through our travels, he ended up just womenizing one after another i mean the boss brought down a girlfriend one time and in, in uh it's in my book in uh, belize and he snuck off with her down the beach before the boss even got a chance to be with her i think it was uh the, it was the two partners i think uh the partner brought down he was single at the time or divorced and he snuck it snuck the girlfriend off and he painted her in silum juice naked running up and down the beach there in turn of island lodge you've probably been there in a great bonefish spot so, I mean, the, the stories go on from there, all the things he did. But if you ever saw the movie Roots, Kunta Kinte got nailed down or something or sold as a slave. And uh, my brother pulled a wahoo through the tuna door and one of the, well, using double hooks, right? One hook's for your hand, the other's for the fish. So he pulled it in there and a the wahoo shook his head and the other hook went into the top of his foot. So he was kind of pinned down with a wahoo and Captain Jeff Fay nicknamed him Kunta and that name stuck so now you got a white guy named Kunta and he walks into a room and like what's your name Kunta it turns everybody's head there's a Kunta in the room <laughs> and uh it's, and you look at any personality out there you know Sting Cher any celebrity's got a one name usually it sticks mm -hmm. so he got well renowned for being Kunta and then his uh, kinkiness of his uh, life took over. He ended up being a male dancer. He met a stripper after he left me and lived with her, and she talked him into dancing. So he actually was dancing in a male club while she was dancing in a, in a men's club. So he, he got to accomplish a lot. And the drugs finally got him after a while. That lifestyle finally got him. He overdosed a couple of years ago. And that's how he passed. Yeah, he, fentanyl got him. Uh. He, he got addicted, just, you know... He, he was such a great spirit. He loved to make people laugh, but he had just couldn't get that P 
peace in his heart. Never had the inner peace. Uh, what a ride. Oh my gosh. But what, what a ride. What would you do differently, if anything, looking back on, on this uh, career that you've had? That's a tough question. Um, to do what we did now with today's information would be incredible. I Easy mean, or easier? It would. I think the odds would be better for what we did. But now the records are already set with Stuart doing it in the right time. It's, it'd be tough. Um, I love the record fishing. I didn't like it. In the, I, I liked it in the beginning, but it was tough to take the mental part because everybody's got four flags up in St. Thomas and I got nothing. Next day we fight a fish four hours. They got four flags up. We got nothing. The next day we break off three in a row. We got nothing. Everybody's got six flags up. The mental part was would get to you after a while. But when we caught that one record, it made it worthwhile the whole season. That's going to be something we remember. Those guys probably won't remember the 14 fish they caught that week. I remember that one fish we did catch. Right. To do anything different, I don't. I don't think some of the designs we came up with when we launched the hooker. You know, I asked. G and S if they could do a rounded transom and they did and the boats backed up better, made the transom better entering for backing up. Right. If I had that, it probably we did have on the sound machine. I built that boat. It backed up at sixteen knots. I'm surprised more offshore boats don't have a, a curved back transom. I'm I'm surprised more people don't do it. I mean, but the Spencers have a flat transom and they back up really good also, and they're really kind of flat. Um, but I do think a little bit more of a rounded uh, transom would be better. Um, but still, thinking back on your question, what would I do different? I don't think there's anything. It's been such a great run. Skip, what are you most proud of looking back at all the success you've had? I'm just proud to be a leader in the sport, to be able to, you know, the places we kind of discovered and brought forth, the Cape Verde Islands and, you know, Costa Rica, the southern part, the places we went around the world to be able to go there. And, and, and now they're like a marina everywhere. The records we caught, some of the things we introduced to fishing, bait and switch, and and uh, and 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 now just being able to get back to a great sport, whether it's through the seminars or some of the tournaments I put on, you know, it's just, it's just been crazy to be able to be part of this sport. The people you meet in this sport are incredible. You've met quite a few. I mean, you know, friends with Stu App and the legends of the sport, and you meet so many great people that are either captains, mates, owners on these other boats. Your world is so big once you get into the sport. You know, it seems like right now, friends are dying right and left because you know so many people <laughs> through the marine industry. Right. And, uh, but be able to give back to the sport now is just so fulfilling. You know, it's just like, what can I do now? What can I do now? And then like the event you went to, we give back now, we're recognizing people and giving back even more to the sport, so. It's just been great. I mean, you're out there in the water. Even the days you don't catch nothing. You're, you know, the name of my boat I have here in town is called Aqua Therapy. Right. You, you, sometimes you don't need to catch anything. You just need to go out there and, and enjoy the fresh air and see in life with birds or whales or porpoise or a flying fish. It's just so peaceful out there. And, you know, you really get your serenity just by going out there. And if you catch a fish, that's extra. Well, good for you. Thank you for joining us. I mean, it's I, I, after reading your book and seeing you, at, you know, at the IGFA events, it's like we've got to. I want to hear the story from the man himself. So, thank you for for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank great, you. Great to have you, Skip. Thank you. Thank sir. you so much. Well, I saw it's West Side Story.